Welcome to another Dorman uh, Lunch and Learn. Uh, we're into ABS uh, for Commercial Motor Vehicles Part 2. Let's get into this. Again, Dorman. Oh, by the way, while uh, I'm switching the slides over here, that's me, if you see it over there. Uh, Dorman, I forgot to mention I did that on the live chat. It's just so you know, the Dorman products, I am not here trying to sell Dorman products. Dorman is doing something differently. They believe that, you know, training is huge to go along with their products. And if you notice, I do the heavy duty trainings. So they're into heavy duty parts, don't get me wrong, but they're mostly automotive. But their philosophy is if the more guys that get some education, training, tips, and all that kind of stuff that we try to do with the lunch and learn and other stuff, you know, the better off they're going to be in the long run because it'll complement their products, you know. So again, just so you know, I don't sell products. The other thing I'm going to get into also is, well, well let, me, let me jump into it. So again, this is me. I never worry about this. More important is, to be very honest with you, is the product that I put out. Did you walk away learning something? So, uh, so what I did with the live one, because when you have in a chat box, on, especially in this one here, I'm going to use a couple different tools uh, when we get to the live portion. And quite often when I'm doing this, there'll be a chat box. Uh, the chat box will be over there saying, asking like, oh, who, who makes this tool? Where can I get it? And so on. So I figured maybe, just maybe, I'll pre put some names, whatever information up, just so you know. So these are the ones that I kind of figured were somewhat important to what we're doing over here. Up here, tstseminars.org. That's another place my buddy G over here, Chi Druglia, he started that years and years and years ago. And actually, there's so much stuff on their videos, everything else, and they have a, what they call a big event for the automotive site in March. Well worth it. Draws a good 600 people at a time for a Saturday, and they provide great training. Now, we're into commercial motor vehicles. So these guys over here, commercialvehiclesafetyalliance.org, the, uh, uh, it's exactly what I said, Commercial Vehicle Safety Alliance. This is composed of all the different states, Canada, Mexico, all the enforcement people over there. These are the guys that typically, you know, if you get pulled over on the side of the road, those of you that are with a fleet, these states belong to that. So that's kind of like a clearing house. You know, they determine what should be out of service and, you know, different violations and everything else. But they're good, good, good resource too for a lot of information when it comes to the enforcement side of it. Now, I did throw in this truck association in New York, NewYorkTrucks.org. Uh, they're basically the voice of trucking in New York. They do a lot, a lot of... Uh, legislative stuff and everything concerns and try to protect the trucking industry but they also do uh, some trainings and stuff and I do I've for years I've done a lot of trainings for them you know brakes electrical regulations so that's a good site to go on to now tool wise you're gonna see me use this U scope and somebody's gonna ask well where can I get that where can I get some interest so without me interrupting and giving a sell job and by the way there's another person for example, I use the tool, I have to buy it. Just because I use it doesn't mean I get any favoritism. But, you know, sometimes somebody will see like, you know, so that's here. So if you're interested in that particular tool, aeswave.com. Now, the other tool I'm going to use uh, besides my fluke and stuff is what they call the N2. It's by Curian. And uh, I'll explain a little bit with each of the tools as we go into it. So if you have interest in that, you most certainly can go on CurianLLC.com. And this is... Uh, He's a very down-to-earth guy, you know, Josh. And that's his phone number. So, and again, ATTS... Chi Truglia, Chi Truglia, my personal friend for years and years. 
he's actually in charge of all these dormant trainings now so you know also that was his you know automotive tra uh, technician training uh, service you know so those are the things you know and again you can google any one of these so let's get going on this over here oh by the way uh that cvsa you can uh that cvsa I just got a little note here. Speaking of, Commercial Vehicle Safety Alliance has scheduled this year's Brake Safety Week for August 2026. And the focus is on brake lining, pad violations, and of course, along comes with ABS. So I just wanted to throw that in again, you know. So expect uh, in that particular week, you, there's, you know, all the enforcement guys will still do their regular uh, enforcement duties, you know, pull a vehicle over and put through the bases paces both the driver and the vehicle the level ones level twos and the driver inspection and stuff but they're gonna highlight on brakes this time around and they always pick an area you know uh next next i call it a blitz they might do like cargo securement they might do tires and so on so you know they're kind of concentrate certain efforts to very focused specific stuff besides doing the regular inspection too so and you get good data once they do that gives you a snapshot of what's going on out on the road so let's get into this diagnostic testing by the way just so you know this is part two okay? part one really was a one hour lunch and learn it gets got you comfortable or if you haven't gotten on you really should get on that portion it kind of gives you the like okay this is how census work this is what we're doing with and get you much more comfortable with uh you know the whys how it works what's out there and it was basically prepping to this part two because part two i'm gonna have minimum amount of slides i must spend more time on trying to do a little hands-on so again this part two minimal amount of slides start out with diagnostics testings so where do you start Oops, get my clicker going here where do you start absolutely understand the system how it works what components are involved and their role in the system what are the specs do you have proper tools for testing so how it works what components are involved in their own system that was part one tell you the truth what are the specs they're all over the place i'll get to that in in a second do you have the proper tools for testing now i'm going to use a variety of tools i'll use a lab scope i'll use a bunch of stuff but you don't need exotic tools to test any of the abs stuff i'm telling you right now so more important is having a good grasp and understanding the relationship and the value or values retrieved with electronic tools information 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 is huge so and i'll be very honest with you information as far as it goes with for years for years i was pretty lucky america wapco when i do for example my two-day break courses the one of the modules when abs first came out i got into uh uh i put a module together for abs i mean after all it's very very important it's part of the brake system now but what you're looking at here for years I was able to get this type of information this one here for particular here okay i tons of different book different systems that meritor had i would actually order them and they were for free and i can i believe it was hems but i must have drove everybody crazy over there because i would order them like you know hundreds at a time you know so i would get a bunch of boxes with all this information this stuff and uh and i would actually you know they'd be part of the class i would pass it out but information wise and i know i'm not going to get into that now but and you probably won't be able to see it but if you look over here like if you could zoom in hopefully i got this upside down of course okay, pages and pages and pages like if codes what to look for everything else that's just one portion of it okay and there's a lot over here too so keep keep it focused in you know i'll just bring this up you'll have wiring diagrams and everything 
And that really is the key to doing a lot of testing. Now, most of the stuff we're going to do is going to be fairly straightforward, okay? Uh, it'll be sensor modulator valves, but once in a while, if you have to get on the computer side, you really need the pinouts and connector numbers. And just so you know, and here also is uh, these systems, I'm sticking with ABS, of course, but you got stability control, you got all sorts of different add on, and I kind of mentioned that in part one systems in there. So you're in the multiple modules. So you're going to get into controller area network CAN systems, and then you're going to have like CAN high, CAN low, and they have lots of good information in these books. They got the pinouts, the voltages that you need to look for. So, but I'm pretty sure you can get online and at ABS I'm so happy to see it's one of the easier easier means of getting information versus like your engines that you have in the powertrains and, and rightfully so because every vehicle out there has ABS and you got to make sure that we stay on top of it. Somebody has to fix these things. God forbid if something goes wrong. And, you know, like, again, you're, we're, we're heading towards systems that have uh, st uh, steering sensors and stuff that has to be calibrated and modules that you have to just make sure they're in a perfect position. But enough with that. So let's move on. We're going to keep it simple. The first thing that's going to happen is, of course, Everybody knows if you've been doing it for you. And by the way, the other thing I do, I try to remind everybody, listen, whoever's watching this, there's probably guys that have been doing this for 40, 50, 60 years, and you're probably comfortable with it. But there's a lot of guys that are just coming into our industry. This might be their very first exposure. So I try to find that balancing act of how do I do it? You know, how do I get a message across? The other thing too is when I do like breaks, just think about this, ABS, uh, I did some lunch and learn with the regular brake stuff, I did one with regulations. You don't have to be a technician, the, the knowledge is so, so huge. So if you're a driver, and to be very honest with you, I get a lot of my enforcement friends, they've come through my cl actual classes and they actually go and they watch on this stuff too because again, they do not fix the vehicles, but however, the more knowledgeable they are, it'll make their job easier. And besides that, you know, I tell them often that, you know, on the roadside, if you go and portray a message or a problem or something to a driver, it puts that enforcement guy in a higher level. So again, doesn't matter if you're a driver, technician, doesn't matter who you are, the more knowledge you gain, so by all means, and any portion of it, all of it, or part of it will probably benefit you. So no matter who you are, you know that lamp check, okay, that's the first thing that's always going to happen. You want to make sure it works, the, the lamp actually works, okay. So if you turn the ignition on, just like your MILs that you have on cars for emissions and stuff, it should come on for a short bulb check and go out if there is no issues. So listen for clicking a solenoids if you're near them, okay? So they'll go through a self-check. Okay? You hear click, 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 click. Once it goes through there, if the lamp stays on, you're gonna have, it's a good indicator that you have an issue or fault. That's as simple as it's gonna get initially. Okay? And here's a slide showing you easy listening. Turn on ignition, wait ABS light, listen to the valve cycle one by one, one to two to three to four, you know, plus two to three plus four and stuff. And I always have fun with this, you know, when I'm doing my regular classes, I tell all the guys in the class that, yo, oh, we're going to do a post test afterward. That's going to be on there. Try to memorize it because I'm going to quiz you. Just kidding. It ain't never going to happen. You know, if everybody's like me, I can't even remember what I did five minutes ago. You start getting too much on the plate here lately, you know. So diagnostic testing can so you have an issue, you're going to want to retrieve codes. 
forever and ever. One of the ways that you could do it is use the blink code uh, diagnostic method and basically a series of flashes leading to specific faults after interpreting the flashes from manufacturer specs specific information. So basically you can go into a book like this, you can get information, you know, and stay there. I'm just going to get something, you know. Uh, Dead air isn't good. I'll keep on talking while I'm doing it, you know. But uh, here's another. You, you could get from Meritor. Nice little cards like this. They're kind of la laminated. And this was, for example, for enhanced easy stop with PLC trailer ABS plane code diagnostic codes. So you can see over there the single digits over here. And it would tell you, for example, three sensor BU1, cable break, short circuit, auto adjustment. And then the action required, it would tell you check sensor, sensor cable, cable connection. It goes on and on and on and on. So this is all good information here, guys. Now, the earlier Bendix system, Bendix, when they started to get out, they utilized LEDs over here. So, right into their, P their computer over here, and if you notice, you have front, rear, right hand, left, modular sensor, ECU, voltage. Now, you repaired this vehicle or this ABS uh, issue or fault, what you would do is you take a magnet and you would just put a strong magnet past it and that would reset that. But I always try to tell everybody that be careful. You're going to reset this and all of a sudden some of the codes would come back, the lights would like. Don't worry, you probably did your job. You did a very, very good job. But guess what was waiting in line, right? You had another stored code. You know, it's kind of like a hierarchy. Let's get one out of the way. So that's what Bendix utilized for the longest time. So again, Meritor has been very, very good for me. So you're going to see some Meritor stuff over here. Uh, they've helped me throughout the years. So I'm using their slide over here, Blink Code act Activation. The Blink Code can be activated by different modes. Blink Code Activation accepted only if there are no wheel speeds present. Constant Power Activation Mode. Switching on the ignition for more than one, but less than five seconds. Switching off and on again then the warning lamp starts to blink. The stoplight power supply may be active simultaneously. The fault code will be displayed three times. So this is another thing to be honest with you. At, uh, it just reminded me, when I'm doing it live, I'm buzzing through the slides pretty good. But if you're over here watching it on your computer or whatever the case may be, you get that little pause button, okay? So you can pause and you can read. Because sometimes I have a tendency to go through it a little too fast. Eh? Now, pictorial wise, blink code activation, ignition on. Okay, you got a little, little bit of a time lag over here, one to five seconds, okay? External indicator lump faults repeat three times. So this is what happens, okay? You're gonna have, for example, flash, flash, flash. You're gonna have a pause, flash, 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 pause, flash, flash, flash. So it will repeat this. And then, of course, you're gonna go into your book and you're gonna figure out, well, what are the three flashes? How do I interpret them? And a book will tell you, for example, you have a sensor failure BU1, okay? Uh, and here are single digits examples over here. Remember, we just did the three, sensor failure BU1. If it's four, sensor failure YE1. And we'll get to that BU1 and YE1 in a few seconds here, you know. So, and yeah, you could have ECU internal failures, you know, communication failures and so on, power supply failure, and it will kick those out. Eh? Here's the E version ABS blink code. So basically it's the same thing, you know, depress it. And this one here is a double digit code. Okay. So you'll have one, two, three, flash, 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 quick pause. Flash, 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 four, long pause, and it keeps repeating those again, okay? And it continues until ignition is turned off, right? So with store faults, here's an example of a store fault over here. The first store fault you got over here, the second store fault over here, third, you know, and of course, system okay. So when it stops flashing, erasing fault codes, depress the switch, 
clear all with actual fault, okay? And again, system, system, system. So basically what happens, if you've cleared, you have no issues and you cleared everything, okay, there's no faults, you get a bunch of fast flashes. One, two, three, four, eight quick flashes, okay? And uh, like I said, if, you, if you're missing on this, just put it on pause, think about it, read it, okay? It might help you out. So here's a simplified two-digit blink code. Again, that's what I was talking about. Flash, flash, flash. Or it could be flash, 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 flash. Too much sensor cap, left steer axle. Okay. Toolbox, we'll get into that in a short here. Now, the other way of retrieving codes and stuff, if you get in a toolbox. Now, Meritor calls it a toolbox. Uh, Bendix is an ACOM and they are great. The reason they're great is to just think about the memory that you can have on a laptop. And if you look over the icons here, you can do stuff very, very quickly. You know, you're going to have a lot of information. You know, you got an ABS lamp is on. It'll tell you, do you have an existing code? If you spin the wheels, you can actually take this down the road, as, you know, laptop, of course, as you're going down the road. Wow, look at all my wheels are coming. Oh, wait a minute. This wheel isn't spinning. You know, left front, right front, left. And you have other options because it will recognize, it will recognize the system that you are hooking up to. So that works pretty good. Plus also, there's component tests that you can do on that toolbox over here. You know, so, but I will get into that a little bit closer over here. Now faults, they could be active or they could be stored. The active fault, condition that currently exists. Example, sensor short or open, okay? That's a no-brainer. However, you might have a store fault, a fault that no longer exists. No different that you get into your uh, powertrain type of faults, you know, whether it be a truck or car, whatever the case may be. So a store fault, is a good example. Loose wire connection, intermittent contact issue. Note in some cases it could be a repaired active fault. Just has not been cleared, you know. So you got to be uh, aware of those little idiosyncrasies. And they're not little idiosyncrasies, but, you know, it could lead you in the long, wrong directions if you don't have some of the information. Uh, repair and clear, of course, now you repaired it, you want to clear it. I showed you on that toolbox, a no-brainer, hit the clear button icon, you know. To clear manually using a switch example, press and hold blink code switch for at least three seconds, then release. And remember I said look for those eight quick flashes that I showed you, that one, two, three, four, five, six, eight, followed by configuration flashes to indicate the clear was successful. If you don't receive eight flashes, the active fault still exists and you got to go back again and try to figure out, you know, what else do I have to do to fix this? There's still something here because as a rule, okay, as a rule, these computers are set up to really do a good job to figure out if that fault is. They're pretty accurate, you know. The one of the, and um, this you'll also, you know, you use your gut feeling once in a while, just like you do with cars and trucks. If you have a uh, situation where all of a sudden you're getting about 10 different 12 codes and you know I could be exaggerating a little and none of them make sense okay you tested everything out everything works you could have a problem with the computer computer just kind of it's all scrambled up and can't figure out what to do but that's an exception to rule most of the time it's pretty straightforward Okay, the proper ABS sensor resistance for most common types of ABS sensor, the sensor circuit is, uh, the sensor circuit is between, you know, and me bad, I got to turn off my phone here, excuse me, can't live without this stuff anymore, you know, but I have some general stuff up here, typically you're into, uh, you're into uh, 700 to 3,000 ohms. Now, this is a general kind of a number here, okay? You still have to get specific with a lot of the uh, OEM stuff, but 
just for our purposes, we'll keep it fairly general. Resistance can be measured at sensors, connection for ease, or at the, and I always try to dive by, now, ultimately, try to get over to the ECU. This way you get the integrity of the whole, you know, you might have a connector here, another one here, another one there. So you're hitting them all, okay? But in all honesty, in the real world, when I'm underneath the vehicle, I will reach for that very first sensor connector just to save myself time because if I pull that open, okay, and my meter says, oh well, okay, I'm not going to the other end. I mean, either way, if I have an issue with that sensor, it's coming out of there, new sensor goes in, okay? So you have a couple options. Testing the wheel speed sensor, visual, connections, installation, rubbing, chafing. If possible, visually check sensor gap and or try to push sensor in to make contact. And I've had a lot of luck. You know, once in a while, maybe it was a sensor where somebody did a brake job or something, and then it's easier to push in. If they actually, if that sensor was moved and the sensor is an old. However, if the sensor gets kind of old and it's been in there a while, good luck trying to push that sensor in. So those of you that work in it, you know what I'm talking about, okay? Electrical check, resistance. Now here's where we, not splitting hairs, but this is what I meant. So if you went into Merit or WAPCO, they want to see 900 to 2000 ohms. The various Bendix system examples, 950 to uh, 1900 ohms. So for example, EC60, this, guys, I, screwed up on this okay i meant to fix this i got too many zeros here so kind of ignore pretend this zero isn't here okay it's 1500 to 2500 ohms you know i put together so many different curriculums and once in a while it's like you know come on guys as if none of you were ever you know made a mistake or nothing you know so but just again so don't misread into this output voltage web go at least two two uh 200 milliamps AC, of course, roughly 30 RPM, you know, just basically spin it, you know. Generation four or five Bendix, at least, you know, 250 AC at half a revolution per sec. But again, that means basically, you know, I got the wheel off the ground and I'm going like this. My resistance is good. I need to see a peak to peak at minimum of that. That's what we're talking about over here. Now, remember I said the YE1, BU2, BU1, and everything. This is where this stuff is important, okay? This information, okay? So if you go in this book, you'll see pictures like this in there. So if you get a code, it's a Y1. You want to always go in there. You see this? Facing forward. Computer is what? It's in the front, facing forward. Well, this could possibly change. You don't know if this is in the back over here and you could have a single axle you could have tandem axles you know or you could have three axles on a trailer whatever the case may be so always reference this in the book if possible yes you might be able to see right underneath here they'll have stamped in there ye1 BU1 and so on. But you know what? Even that's good to know too. What if it calls for YE1 and somebody worked on it and they put it into the wrong hole at one time? You know? So, and as long as we're here, you know, just so you know, if you have any doubts whatsoever, is it BU1, BU, uh, BU2, YE1? You know what? If you have the proper tools to get the codes, switch them and see if the sensor moved. You know, once in a while, I wind up doing that. You know, just, you know, not that I don't like hitting the wall, but I just want to verify, you know, it's a computer seeing what's going on here. So, resistance can be measured across the ABS valve. Solenoid connected to terminals were measured between common pin one either. The resistance should be, again, this is a broad number here, four to eight ohms, could be a little more, okay? And we're gonna do this. You've got a common pin over here, inlet solenoid, exhaust solenoid, okay? Those are the basic three pins that I pick on, okay? Now the modulator valves, let's go a little more specific. Meritor likes to see inlet to ground four to nine, outlet four to nine, 
okay verify the correct pins were tested because you can't go and i'll show you you can go wrong it's just the way they're configured with the ground inside there you could get a wrong reading you know however all day long if you get an ol you do have an issue now the bendix they're saying common to hold three to eight common to release three to eight and this is a perfect sample they also want you to go from hold to release and if you notice the resistance changed and now you're looking from six to eighteen again it's the way they internally uh wired up the ground through the system both of these the way they have the grounds hooked up take the measurements ecu harness connector to also same thing verify harness and connector integrity eh? working towards a valve now a little bit of a caution from bendix when troubleshooting modulator codes check in that inactive trouble codes and event history for over voltage or excessive noise trouble codes so if one of these is found troubleshoot these codes uh, first before pressure modulator valve you know get that out of the way all day long all day long this works on electricity. You got to make sure you have this. Doesn't matter, even even if you're working on an engine, on a car, or a, we preach this all the time. It starts at the battery, because if you don't have the proper uh, ground and voltage, okay, any testing you have to do regarding the electrical portion of it. You're kind of it's all academic you know it can lead you to the wrong direction everything in our vehicle starts with this with the voltages okay. abs real world okay. here's a haldic system and i'm using that as an example okay there's not too many haldic systems out there you know just like you don't have hardly any midland systems out there but this haldix here over here on a trailer stupidly simple it's not a big computer that you might see with your uh, bendix or with your meritor okay so easy to get in by the way the wiring they all look similar they all tend to be kind of like a plug and play thing close to each other but the point i was trying to make with this is that don't do not over complicate it do not over complicate it last in part one i showed you the blue wire you gotta have the constant power okay Okay. and I had the little case thing about you know somebody wired this blue wire to the light thinking oh my lamp isn't powered up oh I heard somebody say something about you know the blue wires for ABS so let me run that over there no the lamp goes through the computer but still that voltage is we were talking about has to come out of the seven way it has to come through that wire this is the Northeast we have a tendency to use in the winter times a lot of calcium chloride and that wreaks havoc on all our wiring connections and so on and ultimately let me tell you something this is it right here it could be as simple as that don't overlook the basics everything we do starts with basics like huge visual when you know if i do classes on automotive or whatever electrical classes i can't emphasize enough take your time out do a few visual you, your eyes and ears touchy feely those are the best tools that you have in your toolbox in your arsenal okay? and of course every once in a while you're going to have somebody this is from the it's just like your mils you know so maybe there's somebody with a truck or whatever heard that you know hey my vehicle gets pulled over on the side of the roadside with those cvs guys and their enforcement guys one of the things they want to look for is my abs working properly well hell i have an issue my light is always on so i don't want to get a violation you know you know what i'm gonna fix that some of you guys remember from the car days you know you're gonna go in there either pop the bulb or you're gonna do what you know cover it with tape you know i'm just i'm just saying you know not realizing that one of the checks is i need to see that light to come on in the first place so i love when people do that kind of stuff and they're not really understanding you know what goes on with or what should be checked so uh Go ahead. I'm not don't even worry about this I'm just trying to show you that we this is one of the tools we're gonna use here and you know it's a lab scope but I'll get into it a little bit better over here so you know the only thing I want to do with this lab scope 
to be honest with you, okay, to be honest with you is that I'm going to mention it again. You do not need fancy tools. Now, I'll use a lap scope and stuff to show you certain things, you know, because it's important. What is the computer seeing? So with a lap scope, I can show you some of that stuff. Uh, ABS Real World, one of the blink cards I've had for years when these first came out, okay? This was kind of neat. It's a card and you can slide this in and out over here. So for example, if I did the flashes, first digit, six, then you had an option, two, two digit flashes. Here's one to six and you see a little star behind. So one to six, there's a key for it. One is right front, two is left front, three is right front, left, blah, blah, blah. So what basically happens is you got six, okay? And then where is the six? Which one of the six wheels it is? In this particular case, okay, you had check for damage tooth wheel, okay? And then, you know, is it six? Is it flash, flash, two? If it was two, it would be on the left front steer axle, or driver's side. But check for damaged tooth wheel. Here it is, okay. It could be a cinch you, you know, every, there, there no doubt somebody was in there. Maybe they had the hub off or whatever the case may be. And somebody hammered, didn't pay attention, didn't look, you know. Maybe they thought that there's a little rust, they got a, you know, sensor code. If they were able to pull that out, you know, if there was out, maybe somebody from the other side, of course, stuck a screw, screwdriver in and turned it. Whoop! It got caught, whatever the case may be. But that's as simple as it can get. By the way, what would you do if you had that? I know what I would do. And this is why, again, I call my stuff ABS Real World. I would take a little bit of a hammer, tap this flat, and that's what we did. Good to go. Okay. Don't laugh, but that's our world. We do whatever it takes to get it fixed. Okay. Does that make sense? So I'm gonna move now over to our little live board here and uh, I'll have Bobby follow me over here. So if you can get over here. So this is a board that I use. I've had it for years and uh, I can see already when we're getting some of the meters, we're gonna have to, you know, the light is gonna be here, but we'll play. play. So this is a board. What you can't see behind here is I have my toners hooked up to 110 volt uh, motors in the back okay. so I got toners over here sensors over here and this is my ABS valve package when we went through it if you can zoom in a little bit you know this is my ABS valve package over here typically you'll see this in a tractor you'll see my relay valve and then you'll see my modulator valves one for each side here's my connections to it okay so if I'm not in the ABS mode I step on the brake I got my supply waiting here okay all I do is a step on my pedal and it's my straight air goes through and it applies my brakes over here but if I go into ABS mode then these will start taking over okay hold release and so on and so on and they will tither very 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 fast okay and they'll exhaust and all this stuff okay? so this is how and I control this with some railroad transformers over here you know and if you move over here to the front uh, these are these would be typical single solenoids that you'd have on the front you know by the steer axle that's what you're basically looking at over here and I'll get to this and we'll figure out what we got going on am I hooked up I'm hooked up over here so if we go over here just so you know I'm powered up over here I will turn on I have an ignition switch over here so I can turn this on and if you listen closely eh, you can hear the click 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 Eh? My solenoid is going on. Eh? If this particular one was live, I'd probably look at everybody and say, do me a favor, write in the chat box. Do you remember which sequence it was? Just kidding. Just kidding. Eh? Now, I could put it into diagnostic mode. But let me switch over to this over here. Eh? 
So if you can zoom in over here, I'm hooked up in my Merter toolbox. Okay. A little bit closer if you can, please. Or is that as close as it'll get? Because I want to spin the wheels. Okay. All right. So if you notice over here, my ABS light is on. I do have a fault over here. Okay. So I can click on uh, It won't go on that's okay I I'll, it'll go on and it can tell me where my fault is and everything else and I'm not sure why it's not going on I got to restart the sequence I won't have time right now but might have to oh I do have to restart it okay. bear with me a second okay. I'm gonna have to exit out of here just bear with me. You can actually watch the sequence here. Murphy's Law, of course, everything's going to go wrong right now. I'm going to close this up. Here's my toolbox. By the way, you'll see pneumatic, hydraulic ones, uh, on-lane, electronic brake control system. So you, they did a good job. They give you a lot of stuff over here. I must have timed out or something. So if you look over here, okay, I want to get into a, I'm on the wrong one. That's what it was, trailer ABS. Okay, now we're cooking. Okay. So let us, let us search for it. Okay. It's very, very sensitive here. I want to maximize it so everybody can see it. In about a minute, I'm going to get a little mad here. Okay. I put on my trailer, unable, started from toolbox, okay. Two seconds, just bear with me. Relax. Toolbox, come on. I'm a little too fast with this. Okay. No. I'm on truck. Okay, there we go. So if you notice over here, this is the way I want it to work. I'll try to blow it up without losing it. If you notice, right away it picked up my configuration. Four sensor, four modulator valve. Okay, light is on. I can look at the speeds over here. Okay, so. Still, ha I'm having issue because I'm on a big screen. But anyway, if I was on my lower screen here but I needed you to see it would actually tell me what the fault is the other thing I want to do now is I'm gonna turn on my toner okay I'll try to get some speed going and if you notice this is what I was talking about I'm booking right now I'm doing 26 miles an hour believe it or not that's 226 uh, 270 200 80 rpms but my point with this was that with this particular case now here i can go on the road get it hooked up okay and if i was in my dlc over here i could actually see you know are my speeds the same all the way around with each wheel or are they different and it just goes on and on is it dropping out do i have an intermittent problem and that's that's the benefit of having a toolbox and of course i have it plugged in back out of here i have it plugged in over here now what's going to happen is i'm going to get out of this here because this is this was one way and i'll get this box out of my way here you know so i can utilize this for other tools now in a real world, I can also use a plink code switch here. So if you get over here, you know, I set up a switch, I hit it, okay, let go. And of course, if you go up a little bit higher, Bobby, okay, you see my light flashing up there. Okay, And then, of course, I would get my codes. For example, I was talking about my little slider thing. That's okay. You're fine. You know, I would slide this up and down and would tell me what the codes were or get into your book. 
Now I'm going to shut this off, okay, because we're going to get into pinpoint testing. Now I'm going to use a couple of tools here. Okay? I'm going to use my fluke. And when it comes to testing, okay, so for example, I want to do a sensor. And I already put my little lead in here from the other day. But if this is my sensor here, you know, if you can home in here, all right, that's good, that's good. This is my sensor. You typically go down underneath, you disconnect it. The problem with the sensor, and this is going up to my sensor, the problem is you don't have to home it in. For me to put my probes in, it would be pretty damn deep. Okay, so I'd have a problem. Get this hooked up. By the way, what I'm doing is this is my N2, so I'll save myself a little time. This is one of the meters I'm going to use. So what I do is I'll sync this. Okay. It's scanning for this little thing over here. It found it. It's initializing it. Okay. And there's my meter that we're going to use for that portion over here. And that's nice, by the way. Uh, Kurian just came up with this pad, but you could hook it up. You get the app. You can hook it up to your phone. Uh, if you have a little whatever cheap pad, put the app in there and you can read it. But let's get back to this. So what happens is all these vehicles have a, when you get a sensor, you typically a sensor comes in different lengths and then you can get an extension tube to make it work a little bit if you got to go farther. So I take these little El Cheapo 10, $13 extensions, okay, and I put a few little whatever terminals you want to put in there, and that makes it nice for me. Now I will put that in here, okay, and I'm good to go, guys. Okay. And now I, it's no-brainer to hook up with my meter, okay. And then if you can see this, yeah, that looks pretty good. Just zoom in, you know, a little more. Go ahead, don't be afraid, not gonna bite. And you'll see it's 1,177 ohms. And you'll do that with all of them, all right? And basically, I'm staying within the range, aren't I? You know, uh, what was a uh, Merter was 900 to 2000. Uh, I use a channel 700 to uh, 3000, but I'm within the ballpark. Now, if it was OL, of course, I don't need to go on any farther. I got a bad sensor. Now, what is the other thing that we can do with this? Okay, remember we were talking about checking for voltage. That's a no-brainer too. So if you have a digital volt ohm meter, you just flip this to volts AC, okay, and you can hone in on it. And what I'm gonna do is, first of all, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn the toner, you know, and you can see the reading. And if you want back up, Bobby, just so everybody can see that I am, you know, see up here, I'm turning the toner. Okay. And now you can zoom back down there because I'm gonna let my little train transformer take over. Okay, so I flip my switch, I'm going to turn it on, and you could probably hear it come on. So now, I, again, I told you I wired it up with a motor, but I want you to see something, okay? Stay, you can stay there, okay? I'm going to pick up the speed, pick up the, whoop, I went OL. Oh well. Don't get me wrong, this is booking, but I wanted to make a point over here, okay? These are averaging meters. It, the sample rate just isn't there. Some of these meters, they're 40 to 400 sa samples per second, and this just can't keep up. So I'm gonna use another meter, okay? Uh, let me substitute, let me get this meter out of the way here, because one of the problems I have once in a while, if I have too many things in the way, Okay. So I'm going to get this, and if you go over here, Bobby, okay, I'm already in resistance over here. The pockets are in my resistance, so let's do the resistance first. Okay. Now this will not drop out, okay? and if you can see that real good, okay, this will not drop out. 
Once I go to AC voltage, the reason it's not going to drop out is because the sample rate on this is like 8,000 and it's got two channels at 8,000. So I just wanted to point that out. So I'm okay here, right? It pretty near matched my fluke 1.1, 1, 1, uh, 160, the K stands 4,000, okay, ohms. But the same thing is over here, okay? I'm gonna put this into my volt pocket. So all I'm gonna do is change this, okay? So I'm in the voltage over here. I'm gonna do the same thing, okay? Hang loose one second. I just, what I did was, in case you missed it, I hit a button, touch, touch the screen, and I'm gonna put on voltage AC because isn't that what we're putting out? Voltage AC. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to turn this on and you can hear coming on. And now I'm putting out, and again, it's in millivolts, okay? But I'm putting out some serious voltage here, you know. So you get a much cleaner signal. And if you listen closely, okay? I'm really kicking this up and it's not kicking out. Does that make sense? So again, I'm not trying to tell sell tools, but at the same time, you got to kind of like, uh, you know, just know what's out there and hopefully you saw the differences with the sample rates and so on. So let me get this out of here and I will leave that on. I'll probably do something else with that. Now, I have... Okay, these leads are here. I also have this U-scope over here. And I'm gonna hook this up. This is the one that I had on the board for AES Wave. Okay, you don't need this necessarily for ABS, but once in a while, a picture's worth a thousand words. But I wanna show you something else here. So I'm gonna turn this on, okay. And I'm gonna do just a little bit of adjusting here. I'm gonna push this over to position. I'm gonna move it up so my wave comes way up in the middle. Okay, are you on it? You can see it, can you get a little closer? Okay, that's good. Now, I'm gonna turn this on. Okay. Now, pictorially, pictorially, excuse me, what you're basically seeing is you're seeing, you know, my toner ring going round, okay? And it's picking up every one of those AC pulses, up and down, up and down. It's gonna show you peak voltage and stuff. The other thing I want you to notice is that, and I'll show it probably with my other loop scope, uh, loop scope, yeah, right, I'm doing fine, you know. It's a Saturday morning, by the way, you know. I can make that picture do whatever I want it to do with a flick of the button, see? I can change this. I can get as many of those little waveforms in as I want. But look at this, okay? I, I kind of picket fenced it a little bit. And if you're looking at go up and down, you got that weird pattern, okay? You got that weird pattern over here. Oop. Let me get back over here. Nice pattern. Wow. Move up here, Bobby. Yeah, back up, move up here. Now try to get close to over here, where my finger is. Right there, right there. You see that gap, and you see my toner going up and down? That's what you were looking at the lab scope. And basically what you were looking at the lab scope is, if you see it on the lab scope, your computer is picking that up. So if your computer is picking that up, you could pick it up as a what? Erratic wheel speed, right? bearing loose stuff like that. Now, this is nice. Look, I, I don't have 
the gazillion dollars of money to build these fancy boards that you can go out there and purchase for thousands of dollars, you know, because somebody might say, oh, gee, why don't you make it perfect? Do I really want perfect? If I want perfect, I'll go to that whiteboard and I'll pick, paint a perfect sinusoidal waveform. In a real world, I want you to see what isn't perfect, you know. So I built this myself. A little bit of a, this is from an alternator. Got my toner ring on there. The alternator's base weight welded my toner ring on there. But it's okay. Besides that, when you're looking at that board, I wired it in myself. I did all the wiring, I did all the hookups and everything, and I'm one of those, if I build it myself, I have a pretty good idea how this system works. So again, you know, for those of you that are out there, oh gee, you know, what a crappy job. Look at it, it's not straight. It's okay, don't worry about it. I'll deal with it, I can handle it. It's a good teaching aid, all right? So I'm gonna shut that off. So everybody happy with that? And I'll actually put my fluke on real fast. I'll bring that over. And you might see it a little different. I'll shut my U-scope off. And actually, I'll put that over here without knocking anything over. Sensors. General sensors, okay. And you can stay on it. All I'm doing is I'm just switching leads over here. I'm taking my U-scope leads off, putting my lead over here. And sometimes this old fluke actually does a really nice job of showing stuff. What you're seeing too here, guys, just so you know, ghost voltage. We have a lot of, lot of lights in here and we're picking all that stuff up. So I'm going to fire it up. And are you zoomed in? You can see pretty good. Okay. If you want, you can zoom in a little better. But this is, this is a, you know, you can see a real zoom in. You can see a real nice picture. The same thing applies here. I don't care how fast that is going up there. I can change my time base on this. I can go back. See, I can pick up only a few of those. And then watch this. I'm going to put, put more of them in. I'm going to put more of them in, and all of a sudden, there you go, okay? And if you notice up here, I'm going, jumping anywhere from 7 to 14 peak-to-peak -peak voltages. This one is nice because it also gives me the frequencies, 892 hertz, okay? So I have a lot of, this was nice, I get a lot of information. So if I went to go to the other side to kind of compare it, I know that if I ran this side at... 800 you can back up a little 800 hertz i'll do the other side you know spin at the same speed but again those are tools that you can have in your arsenal i am gonna do something a little bit different now okay. uh, we're gonna get over to the solenoid valve okay. So I'll make sure this is out of the way here. Now the solenoid valve is up here. I'm gonna disconnect it, pull that cable off. And remember we had, uh, we had the three pins. The top pin is a common, okay? So the lower one is my inlet and exhaust, supply, whatever way you wanna look at, release. Now I'm gonna switch the pockets on this. Okay. I'm going to put this in my common, uh, uh, ohms, excuse me. So I picked it up right away. Now I'm going to put this lead. Does anybody remember what my resistance for that should be? And to be honest with you, if you said low, you're doing good. Okay. Fumble fingers here. All I had was one cup of coffee here this morning. Bobby was too cheap, he couldn't get me another one. So what happens is, I'll go to one of these, okay? and if you zoom in on this, Bobby, down on the bottom, okay? we're roughly around four, four to five ohms. You do it in one, 
and then of course you do it on the other okay so we're roughly fluctuating a little bit but you know this meter picks up real good it's very very sensitive now I check the resistances am I within the specs four to nine ohms five to nine ohms they're all in the specs okay so what I'm gonna do now is I will get my power probe okay and with my power probe I'm gonna hook that to the battery cuz I'm gonna show you something you know I'm gonna show you something that you normally will not get in your book or whatever and I'll explain to you what I'm doing I'll set this over here I'll hook it up to my battery in the back and you heard my power probe come on okay. what I am gonna do this time is okay, I'm gonna switch my two volts in here too and actually I'm gonna pull those leads out and I am gonna use this amp clamp over here okay. inductive amp clamp I'm gonna put, hook this up in here and what this does is hopefully if everything works correctly I like to look at stuff dynamically okay so I'm in my volts I'm gonna put it into amp clamp meter mode if it catches it here Okay. and it wants to know what scale do I want to use I'm gonna pick one amp is 100 millivolts okay I'm out of range up here I'm gonna be on the upper one so what happens is I'm gonna turn this on 80 amps 20 amps I can zero it it's out of range so I'm gonna put my hook it up my ground on my power probe is gonna go on my common over here and I will explain to you why I'm doing this okay I'm gonna hook this around over here I'm gonna turn it on hold on do it again okay. I'm gonna hook this on I got a reading did you see that it went up to two amps I, I got I can invert it okay and I'm having trouble here because this keeps pulling off and if I was underneath the truck I, I would make definitely much better connections but I'm also trying to push time over here okay. is it or is it no it's just clear okay. again I'll put this on there's a zero button here okay. for right now and you're gonna have to do it over and over you see that okay so I got about three four amps okay. I'm, I'm this is where I would definitely want want to slow things down okay so what happens here is say I got 12 volts do the math you know uh, 12 volts if I had like four amps uh, four ohms resistance ohms law three into 12 would be what four right so I would actually come up with four amps now I'm actually staying on this okay I'm turning this on I'm staying on that and the amps gonna be much higher just don't forget these computers they don't like to see that much amps now 
most of the time it's going to tither like that fast and I'm pretty sure you know the computer's going to pulse it and it'll keep the amperage at a very good limit you get an over amperage and you could uh, hurt the computer but I'm doing it right at the solenoid I'm not going anywhere near the computer the point I was trying to make this if I was doing this I would pop the connector off the computer and I would do it on the other end and come in towards the valve. So what basically happens is think about this concept here, okay? If this is my resistance here, if resistance is low, amps is high. This is a solenoid, electromagnetic solenoid. It needs to do work. I need good amperage, okay? If, for example, my resistance is high, what happened to my amperage? Now, this is electrically. I will probably tell or I will probably figure out I have an electrical resistance someplace. Connections, wires corroded, wires, you know, just the integrity is not there. Now, non-electrically, okay, if I'm comfortable with, say, I'll, I'll just pick a number. If I'm comfortable looking at two amps, that's my baseline. Every one I've done is two amps. And all of a sudden, I hook up to this thing, turn it on, and I got like six amps. What do you think is happening? That solenoid is sticking someplace, isn't it? It's just like your starter circuit. When you first crank it over, you got your amp meter on. I mean, you got that surge goes way the hell up there to initially start that motor. And of course, once it starts, the amps drop down and you're back to the charging voltage. But those are the few things I wanted to show you. Okay? Now, let me do a couple other things here. I want to hold up this. First of all, just so you know, I showed you lab scopes and all that stuff. Please, this is simple stuff. Keep it stupidly simple. The lab scopes I showed you, you do not need them to diagnose this stuff. One way of showing you that this is what the computer's looking at, okay? That's the bottom line. I have used it once in a while, especially more if I get into hydraulic ABS, okay? Cars and stuff, it's nice to see. It gets a little bit more involved. They work a little bit differently on some of those, okay? But keep it simple. You got a digital volt ohm meter, you're doing just fine, okay? The other thing is you might say, I don't have a laptop, I don't have the software and so on. I don't get into ABS because I can't get codes. Yes, you somehow you can get codes and I'm holding this up for a reason here, okay? But even if you say to yourself, I can't get a code. Listen, if you got four sensors on that vehicle, you know the simple portion is what? Your resistance, your ohms. Pop each sensor off. If you got one sensor that comes up OL, you know what? You're gonna replace that sensor. That's the bottom line. And then if the light goes out, boom, you're the hero. You got it working, if that makes sense, okay? But yes, do you always have everything that simple? No, once in a while, you're gonna run into an issue. We had, for example, a, uh, it was a straight truck, doesn't matter what, I think KW, whatever it was. Believe it or not, it was a 24 volt for the ABS portion of it. Eh? But one of the problems was ABS light was on. We couldn't get codes, no place to get in codes. We're trying to, to even flash to see what the issue is. Something was wrong with the communication, maybe something was left off. But what we did was, if you can zoom in over here real fast, okay, Get a little bit closer. Eh? Uh, if you look over here, let me get the right thing right here. This is my pin numbers here. And what basically happens is, and I'll turn it around so I can read it to you. That section here, it's a jumper to ground an ABS lamp. So that yellow on top where my finger is, excuse me, this is my ABS and this is a ground. So what my son did, he had the wiring diagram, he flipped over here, you know, he flipped over here to see which pin to go into. And all he did was take a couple pieces of wire, 
got this light bulb here, you know, a couple pieces of wire. He actually inserted it into the circuit. So if he wanted to get the blink codes, boom, he hit the switch and we were able to get the blink codes because it wasn't surely coming out of the dash. My point being is if you have the information, just think about it, you'll find a direction. Uh, remember in the beginning I said that, you know, everything starts with the electricity. You gotta have good power. That blue wire is so important. So if you're hooked to a trailer and your ABS or nothing's powering on, well, easy way is, am I actually getting the power out of the tractor, out of that seven-way plug, the cord over there? Phillips makes a nice little device such as this. And if you hone in over here, eh, you have some LED lights over here. And they're corresponding. They're corresponding to your stop, your ground, turn signals, markers, and of course, your blue wire in there. So if you stick that in there, turn the ignition on in a tractor, and no blue wire light is coming on, you don't need to worry about the trailer, right? Your issue is in a tractor. So in a tractor, excuse me. Those are the few little things I want to point out as far as diagnostics go. So again, I know I'm doing it awful, awful fast. If you didn't see part one, you really need to see part one, okay? And that sets the stage. And this, of course, I tried to do as much as I could. The rest of it is, again, just keep it in mind. Start simple, start at the sensor. If you have readings over here, move on to the other end. Remember the old wiggle test, okay? So you could have your meter set up over here. I'm looking for the other end, here it is. So you could have your meter set up over here. So I'm just giving you an example. Right? So you have your meter over there someplace, doesn't matter where it is. You can go along the connections and you can do this. Right? The old wiggle test. Remember the old wiggle test on your look end meter? Oh, it just came on. Oh, it just came on. Okay. That's as simple as you want to keep it. The other thing I'm going to tell you guys right now is in my shop, Whenever we change the sensor, okay, I don't even mess around, okay? That extension cord that I was holding up over here uh, with the leads, eh? I go in there and I try to get a new extension, you know, uh, I put the new extension cord in there. For $30, it's worth it, guys, all day long, you know, because especially if you suspect in, uh, connection problems, and usually when you do pull these out, okay, they're going to be corroded, you have green stuff, because the trick is we work on it, the vehicle goes down the road, that light needs to stay off. You don't want it to come back next day and the driver is kind of a little angry with you. That's like, man, I'm the one getting exposed to the roadside. I'm the one that's going to get the violations. You, you know where I'm going with this. I discussed that somewhat in part one over here. So I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Uh, I remember in part one, I did just real fast. I forgot I had this that uh, roll stability support system on some of these uh, trailers. This is the muffler, by the way. Just so you know, in case I you don't get to see it, part one, please go see part one. But I briefly talked about this guy over here. And originally, when this came out, again, this is New York had all sorts of dust dirt, everything else on. Uh, you can get these, but not too many parts places stock this. I'll be honest with you, I just washed this thing up, you know, roll it back up the way it was, and it's going to go right back into my computer. It's that simple. All right, so let's go back to over here. We're going to wind it down. I'm, uh, hopefully everybody got something out of it. Uh, Please see part one. It's a marriage between this part two. You'll have a better understanding. My last slide over here is, uh, if you can zoom in over here, please. Okay. Is this 
Dorman. They're having an all-day training event and trade show. It's on Saturday, September 23rd. Okay, it's right there in uh, their area over there. You know where Dorman is. They're in the Philadelphia area. Okay, this is on the automotive side. Okay, you're gonna have an all-day training. Okay. CAN bus communication, advanced automotive lab scopes, driver building, and so on. And these guys, I told you about G. He's my buddy for years. He's he's the premier trainer for the automotive stuff in this country. He is now the Dorman's lead trainer. Okay, he sets everything up. You have Pete Meyer over there. He's been around for years. He's been with Motor Age. Okay, Kenneth Sanders wealth of information and they also added Oscar Gomez and what he's Oscar is doing very very nice guy he's going to do a couple of classes in Spanish because we have a huge Spanish population all over the country okay? and there's going to be a keynote speaker Carm Capriato from Remarkable Resu uh, Results he's really taking uh, uh, kind of he's like the spokesman for our, our industry out there look these guys here if I had uh, half the information, if I had 50% of the knowledge that these guys would have, I, I would be dangerous. I'll be very honest with you, you know. This wraps it up. I'm glad I did the re-recording. It gave me a little bit more time to do some stuff. I went beyond the hour limit that normally we'd be into. Uh, I didn't even watch the time, but I didn't care. This allows you to do a little pause, especially in the slides and stuff. And if you ever wanted uh, to get a hold of me or whatever, uh, let me go back here in case well you could have paused over here to uh take me two seconds this is a minute least amount of slides i've ever had on a presentation okay so you could actually get a hold of me if you wanted to get a hold of me email me if you have any other questions uh i'm i definitely definitely like networking you know big time you know i'm more uh you know communicating with people live type of a person so you know uh that's about it i'm gonna wrap it up and uh so again thank you Dorman thanks you and please look for us to do some more lunch and learns.